Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs, and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you guys are having a good day. We're back here again in the Survival Guide world, but today we're going to be making a copy of this world and we are going to be taking a look at data packs, which is something we have covered briefly in the episode about anti-enderman griefing, but I've had enough people ask me if I'm going to add data packs into this world in future or to showcase a few data packs that I thought it was probably worth doing an entire episode on the variety of data packs that are out there. I'm going to be taking a look at two specific examples of collections of data packs that you can find online, specifically VanillaTweaks.net, as provided by Azumavoid and his team, and Voodoo Packs, which is done by a chap called Voodoo Beard, and both of these have quite a variety of data packs that you can use to enhance your vanilla Minecraft experience. Now, it's not something I'm interested in doing in this world permanently, because the whole idea of this series for me is to show you guys what's possible in vanilla, and also despite the fact that I make a lot of resource farms and stuff like like that which are unfortunately unique to the Java edition and don't work on Bedrock, I don't necessarily want to alienate Bedrock players who might not have access to the same stuff. That said, there are actually interesting things happening in the Bedrock edition of Minecraft that are possibly providing more functionality than even data packs for Java players can. But that's something I'm not an expert in, so I will save discussion of that for another time. Instead, we're going to look at the Java data pack scene and how these can change your Minecraft experience without being quite so intensive or perhaps relying on quite as much infrastructure as traditional modded Minecraft does. So without further ado, I'm going to leave this world. I'm going to make a backup of the world. We're going to load up a data pack test version of the Minecraft Survival Guide world, and we're going to go through a few of these step by step to highlight just what you can change about the vanilla experience. So right away you might be familiar with this website, not least because we visited it a couple of times in the past in this series. We've done an episode about resource packs already, those are things like texture packs and things that add new sounds and block models to Minecraft. We've also taken a look at the data packs section here during our video about anti-enderman griefing, because this is where we got the data pack that allows us to disable enderman from picking up blocks. I've also got the tab open for Voodoo Packs, which is Voodoo Beard's collection of data packs, and there's some interesting stuff. There's some similarities to what you can see on the Vanilla Tweaks site, but there's also a few other exciting packs here that I thought was worth going over. Some different approaches to the same problem and some different problems solved entirely. So I thought I might cover both of these. Let's start with Vanilla Tweaks though, because this has two different sections for data packs, both simple data packs that change gameplay and things like that, and crafting tweaks, which specifically add crafting recipes or change crafting recipes, making some stuff accessible that might not be accessible that way in survival already. Let's take a look at the data packs themselves first, because there are a couple of these that I will go through the process of downloading, and then after that we'll just assume that you know how to download, download them, and we'll look at the, the actual functionality of them themselves. Now here's a couple that I really want to take a look at, primarily because they are some of the more requested ones for this series. Customizable armor stands is one of them. Armor stands can be customized in vanilla Minecraft using commands, but altering them with commands is a time-consuming process. It kind of requires you to understand how a lot of the command structure works. What customizable armor stands does is adds a book that effectively takes the role of those commands and kind of translates it into a user interface that you can use. So I'm going to add that to our data pack selector and eventually we'll be able to download all of the data packs that we've selected here and then we'll be able to just import them wholesale into this copy of the Minecraft Survival Guide world. Double Shulker Shells is another popular one, especially on multiplayer servers where Shulker Shells and end cities in general are kind of few and far between. So Double Shulker Shells basically guarantees that every Shulker that you kill will drop two Shulker Shells, allowing you to make a Shulker Box. So it's basically a one-to-one -one exchange. You kill a Shulker, you get a Shulker Box. As simple as that. Dragon Drops Elytra is another popular one for multiplayer servers because naturally you're going to find that end ships are even fewer and further between than just the regular end cities. And on a server with more than a handful of players, you're likely to run out of accessible locations to find Elytra quite quickly. So having the dragon drop an elytra when you kill it is kind of useful for that respect. And it allows you to get out to the end cities a little bit quicker as well, which might be handy for some players. I'm not going to use that though, because as I've mentioned before, 
I'm not going to fight the dragon again, and I already have plenty of elytra in the single player world, so for single players, unless you don't want to have the challenge of going out and finding an end ship in the first place, you probably won't need that one all that much. Larger phantoms is an interesting one. That basically increases the size phantoms can appear for the longer and longer you don't sleep. I'm pretty sure it is capped after increasing their size something like seven times, but that means you end up with a phantom that's the size of an elephant swooping down at you. So that one can be a little bit scary, but might be a fun challenge. It also increases the health and the amount of damage they do as well, I think. So that might be worth looking into for those of you who want a bit more of a nighttime challenge. More mob heads is another fun one, kind of along the same lines as customizable armor stands. This is the kind of stuff that I would consider adding to my world because it adds functionality to have mob heads drop from basically any mob in the game. Obviously the team adds the heads for new mobs as new mobs are introduced to the game so now that even includes pillager heads and ravager heads and that kind of thing and those can be interesting for decoration in the same way that you already use creepers and zombie heads and skeleton heads for decoration for example. Now you can have a whole variety of them and that can add some interest to your world later if you're looking for a challenge to do once you've completed advancements and stuff like that. Collecting all of the possible mob heads in the game can actually be quite a fun activity. Might also be a little bit gruesome to some people depending on who you ask. Uh, multiplayer Sleep is another one that I will mention here but not download because of course I'm in a single player world but that allows one player to skip the night in a multiplayer world which can be very useful if the other players are in a situation where they can't sleep and that one player really needs to make it day because there's tons of mobs bearing down on them or something like that. Multiplayer servers actually require every player on the server to sleep by default so having a one player sleep option is actually kind of preferable for some people. Player Graves is another one that's definitely worth exploring. This is kind of a middle ground between the default survival experience where you just drop all of your items everywhere when you die and the keep inventory game rule which prevents that from happening and allows you to respawn with everything you are holding. Player Graves is kind of a middle point between those two and it's also based on a grave functionality that you'll find in a lot of mod packs basically allowing all of your items to be collected into a single block that you have to return to and break to recover all of your items but that does allow for circumstances like for example if you fall in lava you can recover all of your items you don't need to worry about them all being destroyed instantly because they all get gathered up into this gravestone which as far as I'm aware does not get set on fire if it's in lava so that can be kind of useful you can return to that spot once you've gathered a little bit of stuff and you don't lose all of your progress but you still have the challenge of getting back to where you died in the first place and player graves as far as I know will also stay there indefinitely so if you can if you can't find the area that you died within five minutes all of your items aren't going to despawn even if you're in the right area and you're loading chunks so that can be pretty useful for people who don't want the you know the full kind of cheat as it were of the keep inventory game rule but also don't want to end up losing all of their progress and losing all of the gear they had on them. And those are the data packs that I'm going to showcase for you actually in my Minecraft world. I'm going to add one more to those and that is the terracotta rotation wrench just because that involves actually crafting something and I will show you guys exactly how that works when we get into the game. But the terracotta and redstone rotation wrenches basically are there to allow you to rotate glazed terracotta blocks which can be a little bit tricky to place in the direction that you want them and the redstone wrench allows you to rotate redstone components once you've placed them now you've all seen the difficulties i've had in this series before with the direction of pistons and stuff like that so chances are you might run into those issues in future and a data pack like the redstone rotation wrench doesn't add a huge amount to the game but does just allow you to avoid some of those more time consuming sections where you can't place a piston facing in the right way and you have to break half of your redstone contraption just to get it down in the right direction might be useful to you. There are of course a bunch of other data packs that we could take a look at here but for the purposes of time I'm not going to go over all of them today. As you can see from the links under each of these packs Azuma has made videos explaining most of them himself so you might want to check out each of the videos on vanillatweaks.net if you want to take a look at that any further but for now I'm going to hit download we're going to save all of this as a zip file that's going to get unzipped into our data packs folder in the survival guide data packs copy that I've made. So as you can see the copy of the world is here I'm going to open that up go into my data packs folder where we've already got the anti enderman grief and I'm going to move all five of these data packs over into this folder. Now when I load up my world that's going to allow all of the data packs to load up so we shouldn't need to run the reload command or anything. If you're adding these to a multiplayer server and the server is currently live you might need to either restart or just go into the world and type slash reload if you're the admin of the world and you should be able to reload the data packs as soon as they're in your data packs folder without having to restart the server. 
While we're here, let's also take a look at the crafting tweaks section because we've got quite a few interesting packs here that you might be interested in. For example, craftable gravel, and it will show you the crafting recipe up here on the right hand side, as you can see, allowing you to craft gravel from flint. Flint is one of my nemeses in Minecraft. I find the amount of flint that I get if I don't have a silk touch shovel to be kind of annoying. And now you can trade flint to fletchers, I believe, so it is possible to get rid of it that way and turn it into emeralds. However, the option to turn some of that annoying flint back into gravel, especially since gravel is such a vital crafting ingredient for concrete, is going to be kind of a useful thing. So you might want to add that to your world if you find that a useful crafting recipe. Likewise, you have things like being able to craft coral blocks, and normally you can get coral tubes and fans and plants, that kind of thing, but you don't get coral blocks renewably, and people don't always want to destroy coral reefs. So you might want to add that crafting recipe as well. You can get the coral plants by bone mealing the floor of warm oceans, so then you could just gather those up the way you normally would. There are 2x2 and 3x3 variants of this recipe by the way, so if you feel like the 2x2 recipe is too cheap, you can always go with the 3x3. There are a few other great crafting recipes here, I won't go into all of these once again, but it does makes sense to have things like uncraftable nether wart, for example, using nether wart as a resource block, where normally you can't uncraft a nether wart block back into nine nether warts the way you can, say, an iron block back into nine iron. This allows you to break it back down, so that's kind of useful if you want to use that as storage for your nether wart. Also, droppers to dispensers, being able to add a bow shape around a dropper to turn it into a dispenser. Super cool. I like that as a crafting recipe, so I think I might add that to my world as well. Once again, we're going to down download these, but in this case we don't have to worry about unzipping them from the file. In fact, all you need to do is drag that zip file with the code number there into your data packs folder, and as you can see when you open it up, it just has data and it has all of the little folders inside of there. So that stuff will automatically be read in the zip file by Minecraft, so you don't need to worry about unpacking that zip file any further, that's totally fine. Last of all, we're going to take a look at Voodoo Packs. This is at mc.voodoobeard.com, and Voodoo Beard has collected a really interesting bunch of data packs here. The ones I'm going to look at today specifically are Shulkamites, which allows you to effectively farm shulkers in a new and interesting way. Uh, it's, it's a bit different from the two shulker shells pack. Instead, as you can see from the animated gif here, what you have is a an endermite burrowing into a purple block in the same way that a silverfish would burrow into stone if you leave it alone for long enough, and it becomes a shulker. So you can farm shulkers in the overworld if you have access to purple blocks, so that doesn't necessarily allow you to get shulker boxes early, it just allows you to go out, get some chorus fruit, and start farming them that way. And it's quite a balanced way of actually allowing shulker boxes to be farmed. So I'm going to download that and we're going to experiment with that a little bit today as well. There's a few other great data packs here if you're interested in expanding your default Minecraft experience though, and this bed sleep menu system might be a really interesting alternative to the one player sleep data pack that we didn't download because I'm on a single player world anyway, but this actually allows you to skip to the day or the night and change the weather if you want to, which gives you a little bit more control over your environment. There have been several occasions on which I've had to wait around for night to fall, which could be completely resolved if we had a pack like this. Now naturally it's a little bit cheaty sometimes to get thunderstorms whenever you want them because that means you can make as many charged creepers as you want to and that kind of thing. So I'm not going to enable that today, but that is kind of an interesting option for those of you who want that accessible to you. Voodoo Beard also has a few packs like the ones on Vanilla Tweaks, for example, for Shulkers dropping two shells, Elytra dropping from the dragon, anti-enderman griefing, that kind of thing, and a variant of player graves here as well. But there are a few other worthwhile ones that we may as well mention as we're scrolling down the page. Having the chance for any drowned to drop a trident, with the default being 30%, and you can change that. Kind of useful, considering the amount of people who've let me know that Bedrock Edition has a much higher chance of dropping tridents from any drowned than than Java Edition does, where you can only normally get a trident from a drowned who spawns holding a trident. So yeah, it might be might be worth that if you uh, really feel like changing your trident drop chances and removing the challenge of having to hunt for a drowned and then hope you get lucky. Some other really significant ones are crop harvesting, where if you have a diamond hoe in your hand, you kind of automatically replant anything you walk over, allowing you to effectively auto farm stuff just by walking around. is is quite clever and is also a little bit of a time saver if you're somebody who has large crop farms you want to maintain. And possibly the ultimate cheat over here, the spawner scanning data pack, which once again, I'm not going to add into this world today because it's 
very in-depth and would take a little while to go over it, but what you have here is something that allows you to break down spawners, destroy the spawner, and then create a, what's called an imprint matrix that you can actually add to a resource block in your world. So iron, gold, diamond, and emerald blocks will each create a spawner with a larger radius than it had before. So you could be within 48 blocks or 64 blocks of a spawner and allow it to actually spin up and spawn stuff. And it's a very different to vanilla where you don't have that amount of control over spawners. You basically have to build farms around them because you can't move them using silk touch, which is something that a lot of people have asked me about in the past. This pack allows you to move spawners in what is a slightly more costly way because obviously you're sacrificing a block of diamond or a block of emerald. It's easy enough to farm emeralds though. So realistically, you could find yourselves with some very powerful spawner farms if you do that. So. I recommend playing with this one carefully. If you're like me, you probably don't want to alter the vanilla experience this much, but it could be worth it for people who are finding the default vanilla experience a little bit dull and want to play around with spawners a little bit more. But enough about that. I think I'm fine just showcasing Shulkamites today, so I'm going to drop that into my data packs folder as well. We're going to hop back into this copy of the Minecraft Survival Guide world, and I'll try and showcase a few of these data packs for you. And welcome back to the survival guide world, now with data packs, <laughs> although we had one data pack before, I suppose. But things are a little bit different now, and the first thing that happened when I logged back into this world, which I didn't get to show because I wasn't recording at the time, it has added new recipes to our recipe book. So we should now be able to use the crafting recipes that I've added, starting off, I think, with all of this flint that I want to get rid of. Yes, there we go, it's unlocked the recipe for crafting flint into gravel, we put that in a 2 by 2 oh, this is good. This is very good. Remember, this world is not permanent, though, so I'm not going to just cheat and turn all of this stuff into gravel. Let's face it, it's not going to create that much gravel anyway. It's just going to get rid of any flint that you gathered in the gravel acquiring process. So that's kind of useful to me. It's personally something that I kind of like. Aside from that, we have a few other recipes added. We have the dropper to dispenser, for example, which we can probably find a dropper up in here if we have one. Those are all dispensers. Okay, great idea. <laughs> Let's quickly make a dropper using the cobblestone and redstone dust there. I've got some sticks on me, I've got some string, and the recipe even appears in the recipe book like so. It just adds it as another crafting recipe which would show up as normal. So that's really useful having to have a dropper crafted into a dispenser. Actually allows for easier crafting of a large quantity of dispensers as well because unlike bows, uh, sticks and string will both stack. So if you have a stack of droppers, a stack of sticks in each of these spots, and a stack of string over there, you should be able to craft 64 dispensers at around the same speed it would take to craft 64 droppers or furnaces or anything else that can be single click crafted in here. Kind of useful when you want to create a large quantity of redstone components very quickly. Let's take a quick look at nether wart block, which we should now be able to break back down into nine nether wart. There we go, turning that into a storage block. Once again, don't really mind that much about that, but it's just an interesting example of it. And finally, oh, coral blocks was the other one that we added, wasn't it? Yes, a two by two set of coral plants, or possibly even a three by three. Yeah, I think I think we ended up downloading the three by three pack in the end. So let's use these nine bubble coral here as an example we can hop down here to our crafting table and there you go it's already there in the recipe book being able to craft that up so crafting recipes dead easy to add and i like the fact that you can modify the game just a little bit to suit your needs especially if you're on a multiplayer server where resources might be a little bit tighter if you have to share them now in order to showcase the player graves data pack i kind of want to get one of these iron golems mad at me <laughs> so i'm going to head up here with my elytra and we'll see how quickly an iron golem can take me out because these guys, when they get mad, they really get mad. Oh, it looks like he's just going to walk into the iron farm instead. Well, how about you, fella? You can probably yeet me off the top of this thing. There we go. Yes! <laughs> and when we respawn, we should find... There we go. Our grave location has been put in the chat there, and you should be able to find your way back to it and recover the items from your player grave. It did look like a lot of the stuff spilled out of us there, but as you can now see, up there... In the sky, we should have a player grave. Now, I wonder if this golem is still going to be mad at me. Might be a bit of a problem for me if he is. As you can see, my experience has spilled out all over the place, so that might still be a problem if you end up landing in lava. But at the end of the day, you can only recover seven levels from losing all your levels that way, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem anyway. Now, is this guy still mad at me? Or is it okay now? Now he's killed me, I think... I think I'm fine. I won't get too close to him. Instead, all I need to do is sneak on this grave and... All of my items have been returned to me, including the shulker boxes full of items that I had. They're all still intact. That 
is a very, very neat system. And I think I need to reorganize my inventory a little bit here. Then I can take revenge on this guy for killing me. There we go. <laughs> Get in the iron farm. Also, I'll have the block of podzel as well. Thank you very much. So in order to enable customizable armor stands, we need to have cheats enabled and we need to run a command to activate the function that gives us the book allowing us to control armor stands. Now, I don't think there's any kind of crafting recipe alternative for this. You actually need to be the admin of a server if you're using it on a server or have the admin set up a command block where it will give the nearest player, for example, a uh, an armor stand book. So if we go to function, like so, we can auto fill that and we need as underscore statue enable, like so. Run that, it gives you the book. And when you open up the book, you will see that it has a variety of clickable options in here. The clickable options on the front page will just take you to whichever section of the book you want to go to, including the credits. I recommend <laughs> taking a long look at the credits. But from the rest of the pages, we can do a whole bunch of useful things to this armor stand. For example, first off, let's check our target to make sure that, yep, that's the armor stand we're using. It glows for a couple of seconds, just so you can be aware of which armor stand you're changing and then if you go to style settings for example you can add show arms which now allows the armor stand to hold items if we say for example give him yep i can give him my shovel like that and i can take the shovel back again by right clicking on him which you can't normally do with armor stands unless they have arms that are added with a command uh on bedrock edition i believe they come with arms by default in java edition you only ever get the basic armor stand without arms so that's definitely worth having if you're interested in doing some interesting stuff with decoration. There are a bunch of really great preset poses that you can have. For example, you can have the armor stand standing to attention, so the arms are down at the sides, really good for suits of armor and stuff like that. Let's see what else we've got here. Uh, face palm, my favorite. <laughs> I like that. We can have a stargazing one who's looking up there. I kind of like that one as well for holding items. I think that's kind of neat to have the item at an angle like that. And then for example, we can adjust the rotation. So let's set that to 45 degrees and then let's rotate it to the left. And there we go. We have something that's facing on more of a 45 degree angle now. Not only that, but you can change the position of the armor stand by nudging it a few pixels in each direction. Basically each number here is is like it, if it says one that's one pixel over on the block say for example if we go minus one on the x it's going to move over one block so it kind of stays snapped to the 16 pixel grid of a default minecraft texture but of course you could have it go eight pixels over that way making it more or less halfway over onto that block now. It does point out that you should turn gravity off before adjusting the Y position because otherwise it's going to sink into a block. So let's turn gravity off and then let's go down maybe halfway into the block. There we go. So you've hidden the base plate entirely down there and it's now sunk into the ground a little bit like it's kneeling or something like that. You can also, if you want to, choose to make the armor stand completely invisible, which leaves the item hanging there in the air. You can still claim it if you know where the armor stand is, but this is perfect for creating like custom models and statues and stuff like that, allowing you to put say a pickaxe buried in a block but have the pickaxe actually be a 3d object that exists in the world kind of cool although it's kind of weird figuring out exactly where your armor stands are after that. In order to take a look at Voodoo Beard's Shulkamite pack, I actually have all the purple block I own. There's six blocks of purple in here with a two high wall just so the endermites can't crawl out. And we're just going to stand in here spamming enderpearls until we get an endermite. And then once we've done that, yep, there we go. We can spam an enderpearl to get out of here before the endermite kills me. Remember though that you will probably want to stay within 32 blocks of the endermite just to make sure it doesn't despawn. So hopefully I haven't accidentally despawned that one by mistake. Nope, it's still there. Okay, great. <laughs> and if we wait with this guy for a little while, hopefully after a couple of minutes, it should burrow down into one of the purple blocks and become a shulker. Now it's not going to become a shulker box. It is actually going to become a shulker. So this is also kind of a neat way of getting live shulkers in the overworld for advancements like how did we get here although if you're interested in challenges like that it might be even more fun of a challenge for you to bring a shulker back from the end yourself i guess if i wanted to make it even more fun in here we could potentially spawn a few more endermites as well but i do find this quite a balanced way of generating shulkers in the overworld it Im involves you gathering a whole bunch of ender pearls throwing them around, losing health while you're doing that and having to regain health, and the chance of endermites spawning is still relatively slim, so this doesn't feel too OP as far as I'm concerned. It still requires you to go out to the end and get all of the resources necessary to do something like this, 
obviously once it's there yo there we go we have a shulker in the overworld now <laughs> that's so cool all right and eventually once this guy spots me he should start to attack like normal yep there we go and <laughs> we have to deal with a shulker who could potentially levitate me but there we go we actually get to demonstrate the other addition to the pack from uh, vanilla tweaks which is double shulker shells guaranteed there we go and if we wanted to we could just fill these in spawn a few more endermites and get five or six shulkers out of this more mob heads will work differently to how you are used to getting zombie creeper and skeleton mob heads it's actually quite similar to how you would expect to get a wither skeleton skull there is a small chance of a mob you kill dropping a player head sized representation of itself and i'm going to try and kill a few passive mobs out here in the river now you'll notice that what we're mostly getting here are just the normal drops we're getting raw salmon and so forth because the more common mobs like salmon, like the, uh, you know, the, the passive mobs that we have in the farm, cows, and the kind of stuff that you can expect to farm frequently will have a smaller... There we go, we got a salmon head. Hey, there it is. <laughs> you can actually have a, a smaller percentage chance of getting the uh, the farmable mobs than you do with a more rare mob like a ravager for example like if you were to fight a ravager there are very few chances that you get to do that because they only occur during raids they're not a naturally spawning mob and so typically you will find that some of the mobs like cows and chickens the more common ones have a fairly low drop chance whereas some of the rarer mobs have a higher drop chance let's pop the salmon head up here on the loom you'll also find that for the different colors of sheep there are different colors of sheep head but once again because sheep can be farmed they are quite difficult to acquire in large quantities now with creepers zombies and skeletons the method of obtaining their head remains the same in this data pack so it's not been altered at all you do still need lightning striking a charged creeper and then for the charged creeper to blow up the creeper zombie or skeleton in order to obtain those heads and i'm fairly certain that the way they've written the data pack it's actually possible for a charged creeper to give you a guaranteed drop of any other mobs head as well but i could be wrong about that that would be pretty neat though if it was a thing and I think a, a creeper just killed a skeleton. Now slimes, because they split up into large numbers of small slimes and that's when you kill them, you'll find that the slime head has a very low chance to drop. Likewise, spiders actually have a relatively low chance to drop a head because they can be farmed from mob spawners. But like other items, these drops are affected by looting. So if you're running around with a looting sword trying to kill mobs that way, it is more likely that you'll be able to get a mob head from any of the other mobs other than zombies and creepers and so forth than it will be if you're just using a regular sword without looting so use your looting sword for this and who knows you might find yourself getting a whole collection of mob heads before too long the last data pack i wanted to showcase to you is the terracotta rotation wrench and for that you'll need three gold and one iron and now there seems to be a bit of an issue with this pack right now where it doesn't display the uh sprite for the item it only shows it as a knowledge book right now so we can put those in this shape like so and it's a shaped crafting recipe that can happen either way around so we can put three gold ingots in an l shape there with an iron ingot as the handle and that normally shows you a oh there we go <laughs> we got a a wrench and it needs some sort of texture pack it comes up as a carrot on a stick right now because the way data packs work is that they can't actually add new items into the game because that is effectively modding uh, what data packs typically do is use items that are underused in the game and as we've seen elsewhere in this series the only time we ever use a carrot on a stick is when we want to ride a pig which nobody really does as a means of transportation or anything so your wrench will be safe from pigs if you want it to be and now we can grab some black glazed terracotta we can put it down in basically any formation that we want to i don't know which direction i want any of this stuff to go so let's put it say there for example and some of this is clearly out of alignment with the rest of the pattern but by using the wrench which right now is a carrot on a stick which looks a little bit weird and right clicking on it you can actually rotate it probably works better if you don't have a shield in your offhand so let's uh, let's throw that out and let's yeah there you go you can just rotate it around just by right clicking on it into whichever formation you want and some of you may be crying out for this stuff to be added to vanilla minecraft in general because placing glazed terracotta it doesn't place the same way around as it looks in your hand which is always a little bit weird to me so having a rotation wrench might just be the answer to your prayers in that case it might just be the thing you are looking for to enhance your vanilla minecraft experience a little bit 
I think that is everything that we covered today. We had a couple of crafting recipes, we've had a few different data packs, and nothing that has altered the game in a huge way. But the, the, the philosophy with data packs is typically to stick to what the vanilla game has to offer and create a kind of vanilla plus environment to it which you know some people it may not be your back and my philosophy with this series is really to stick to the default vanilla experience at least of java edition as much as possible so like i said i'm not going to keep this version of the world with all the data packs and stuff in it we've added the anti enderman griefing data pack just so that my builds and stuff don't get messed with too much but that is probably as far as we'll go with the main series but i hope you've enjoyed this look at data packs i hope you've enjoyed seeing what is possible and who knows in future there may be even more stuff that it is possible to do outside of this and i hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of the minecraft survival guide thank you so much for watching don't forget to leave a like on this episode if you enjoyed it subscribe if you want to see more and i'll see you guys soon take care bye for now